This video lecture is for the Theology 2 class at the East Asia School of Theology. And this lecture is entitled, Views of the Tribulation and Rapture of the Church. <clears throat> if you've ever read the book Left Behind or watched the movie Left Behind, then you are probably aware that one very popular idea about the end time is the idea that there will be a rapture before the great tribulation. Um, the rapture is when Christians will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord um, in the air. And so you know that this is a popular idea, but when exactly will the rapture be? will occur before or after the Great Tribulation, or will it occur during the Great Tribulation? And speaking of the Great Tribulation, that leads to another question. What exactly is the nature of the Great Tribulation? Is it simply an allegorical way of talking about the ongoing struggle of believers throughout history, or will there be a literal period of exceptional tribulation like nothing the world has ever seen? The great the questions of the rapture and the great tribulation are some of the key questions that are raised in eschatology. And so today we're going to look at the question of the rapture and of the Great Tribulation. So in the history of the church, um, four main views have emerged about um, the rapture of the believers, although there are many variants within each perspective of the perspective view. So the four major views are as follows. Number one, pre-tribulational. This view says that Christ will remove his church from the world prior to the great tribulation. Therefore, Christians will not suffer during this time of God's wrath upon the unbelieving world. The second major view of the rapture is post-tribulational. This, that, this view says that Christians will be caught up with Christ in the cloud at the end of the Great Tribulation. And in a sense, Christians will act as a kind of welcoming committee to welcome Jesus at his glorious return to earth. This also means that Christians will go through the Great Tribulation and will suffer many of the same events as their non-Christian neighbors. <clears throat> a third view of the rapture is known as the mid-tribulational view. This view says that the rapture will occur halfway through the tribulation. That is, it will occur three and a half years into this seven year period that is known as the tribulation. The thinking is that God's wrath will be intensified during the second half of the Great Tribulation, and therefore God's desire is to spare his children from his wrath upon the unbelieving world. And then there is the partial tribulational view. This view says that only faithful Christians will be raptured at the beginning of the tribulation. Those Christians who are unfaithful will remain on earth and go through the suffering of the great tribulation together with non-Christians. So these are the four major views of the rapture. And so now we're going to look at each of these views in turn along, and we're going to explore their various strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> so the first view is the pre-tribulational view. So the basic tenet 
of this view include number one, the break tribulation is unique. So this this says this means that the suffering that occurs during the great tribulation is you is unique in all of history. Yes, there has been suffering else other at other times in history, but nothing compares to the suffering that will occur during the great tribulation. And that's because during the great tribulation, God's wrath will be poured out upon sinful mankind. Okay, another tenet of the pre-tribulational view is um, according is according to First Corinth, First Thessalonians four seventeen, there will be a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Here's what First Thessalonians four seventeen said: After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. <clears throat> and this is where we get the word rapture from, because the word rapture comes from the Latin word rapare, which means to be caught up. And so in this verse, it talks about being caught up with Christ to meet the Lord in the air. So the um, and so, According to pre-tribulationists, Christ will only return part of the way to earth, and he will then rapture the church. Now, a third tenet of the pre-tribulational view is that the purpose of the rapture is to remove the church from the seven years of the tribulation, and they base that on uh, a verse, a key verse in um, 1 Thessalonians 4, which says that God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. Now, they also have some other bases, uh, some other reasons for why they come to this conclusion. Uh, one of them is that they argue that Matthew 24 is speaking to Jews and not to Gentiles. Matthew 24 is uh, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives on the night that he was betrayed. And, um, you know, his disciples um, began by saying to him, you know, look at this great temple. Isn't it amazing? An amazing building. You know, look at it. It's, it's, it's amazing. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, not a stone, not a single stone will be left upon another from the temple. And so that's when the disciples then asked them, when will this be? And what will be the signs of your coming? And so Matthew 24 is where Jesus uh, speaks to his disciples about the signs of his coming, the signs of his return. And so <clears throat> pre-tribulationists, argued that Matthew 24 was given for Jews, not for Gentiles. They also argued that the church will not experience God's wrath. And this is because of that verse in 1 Thessalonians, which I told you. It's 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Um, there are a few other verses that they cite. For example, um, in Revelation 3.10, it talks about being um, able to escape the, um, the trial that will come upon the whole world. And so pre-tribulationists argue that this Revelation 3.10 also points to a pre-tribulational view of the rapture. And then um, they also argue that 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, and following um, from Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 or 1 through 4, depending on who you talk to, um, they point to these verses as supporting a pre-tribulational view also. Um, because <clears throat> the, um, 
those verses talk about how in the last days there will be a great falling away and people will be troubled um, and Christians will be troubled about you know reports that the day of the Lord has come and so um, in second Thessalonians chapter 2 Paul goes on to say that the day of the Lord will not happen until the man of lawlessness has been revealed and so pre-tribulationists um, and interpret these verses in such a way that supports their view that the rapture will occur before the great tribulation. <clears throat> and so they, they go on to say that Christians will then be transformed into, into the nature of their glorified bodies and uh, the, into the nature and condition that will be true of them for all eternity. In other words, at the rapture, pre-tribulationists believe that at the rapture, Christians will receive their glorified bodies. Um, they also believe that at that time, Christians who have died before the rapture will be resurrected to join with those who are raptured. <clears throat> Another tenet of the pre-tribulational view says that immediately following the rapture, all Christians will be judged. And this is based on 2 Corinthians 5.10. Um, and so um, some, some people who hold to the pre-tribulational view call this the Bema Seat Judgment. Um, and they say that Christians will be judged at this time and then later, um, will come the great, the final judgment of unbelievers. Um, Pre-tribulationists then say that Christ will return after the tribulation, and he will come visibly in triumph. He will resurrect believers who have died during the tribulation, and these resurrected believers will join the previously resurrected and the previously raptured to join to reign with Christ in the millennium. And finally, they would they uh, hold to the belief that Christ's return is imminent and that his re he can return at any time, indeed at any moment. So they have a, um, they, they, they get very excited because they believe that Jesus is coming soon, very, very soon, right? And so um, they have some reasons for why they hold to this view. Um, one reason is that they use a literal method of interpretation. So um, here's the quote. When the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. In other words, if the plain sense makes sense, then that we should accept that as the correct interpretation of scripture. For example, Israel is always refers to ethnic national. Israel. Um, this, this form of interpretation also tends to be typological, seeking a spiritual meaning behind the literal. So, for example, they would look at certain Old Testament events and persons, and they would see them as types of Christ. And in similar ways, they will look at certain events or certain institutions in the Bible and see them as foreshadowing of events that are to come. Um, another reason why pre-tribulationists hold to this view is because they believe there is a strict separation between the church and Israel. So they, they see the church and Israel as two different people representing different aspects of God's unified but variable 
program. And so this is where the dispensational side comes in because dispensationalists believe that God is the same God, but he has acted at different ways at different times throughout salvation history. And so this is why they say that these that the church and Israel are two different aspects of God unified, but variable program. They also hold to the pre-tribulational view because they believe there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Um, and so for them, the kingdom of heaven refers to Israel and the kingdom of God is universal, God's universal kingdom. And so the church is one aspect of God's universal kingdom, in their view. And another reason why pre-tribulation is told to their view is because they believe that the purpose of the millennium is to fulfill God's promises to Israel, which are viewed as unconditional. Now, earlier, um, Dr. Lewis talked about um, how, how, we, how different Christians understand the covenants that are laid out in the Bible. And so this, this shows us how our understanding of the covenant does play into how we interpret the, the biblical passages about the end time. Okay, so here are some critical reflections or perhaps some objections to the pre-tribulational view, okay? So one, one objection is that that verse, those verses in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 also describes the rapture as happening with a loud command and with the trumpet call of God. And so um, those who object to the pre-tribulation view would say that these words do not sound like a secret coming because the pre-tribulationists believe that Christ, there will be a secret coming of Christ when he raptures the church and then there will be a visible coming of Christ at the end of the great tribulation. And so these words, these descriptions of Jesus, of the rapture as happening with a loud command and with the trumpet call of God does not sound like a secret coming. In fact, uh, these words sound very similar to the language that is used to describe Jesus' visible return. For example, um, there's Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31, which describes Jesus' visible coming, at which time the angels will gather his elect from the four winds with a loud trumpet call. Okay? So this is one objection to the pre-tribulational view. Another objection to the pre-tribulational view is centered around 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, because this verse is really key to the pre-tribulational view. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says that God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. And so pre-tribulationists really, um, they, they view this as a really key verse because they argue that this is why Christians will not go through the tribulations because Christians have not been appointed to suffer God's wrath. And they interpret that, under, that word wrath in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to refer to God the outpouring of God's wrath upon the unbelieving world during the Great Tribulation. Now, here's the pre-tribulation of, I mean, here's the, the objection to the pre-tribulationist interpretation of that verse. 
not all suffering that Christians experience is the result of God's wrath. Yeah, I mean, many times Christians suffer in many different ways. And not it's it's not always the case that when Christians suffer, that it's they're suffering because of God's wrath. Sometimes Christians suffer because of accidents. Sometimes Christians suffer because of persecution. And sometimes Christians suffer just because we live in a fallen world, which is subject to sin, death, decay, illnesses, and all the other normal things that go with a fallen world. Those who object to um, the pre-tribulationist interpretation of 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, will, would also point out that God's people have suffered persecution at various times and places throughout history. And if you look at church, if you read church history, you'll find that some of these persecutions and some of the ways that Christians suffered during these times of persecution have been absolutely horrific. I mean, Nero had used, Christ, put Christians on poles in his garden and lit them as human bonfires to light his garden during his garden parties. Um, in Japan, Japanese Christians were literally crucified um, and it just, and there are countless other descriptions of horrific suffering that Christians have endured for the sake of Christ. And so if these, if Christians endured sufferings like these in the past, how can that be any greater than the sufferings that Christians will experience during the Great Tribulation? Okay. So those, that's, that's another objection to the pre-tribulational view. And, and there's and yet another objection to the pre-tribulational view says that those who teach a pre-tribulation rapture may be giving Christians a false hope that they won't have to go through the tribulation. Now, the idea is um, one re is that one reason why the pre-tribulation view is so popular among certain Christians is because it means they won't have to suffer during the great tribulation. And so, you know, who wants to suffer, right? But the argument here is that if you preach that the, if you preach and teach that the rapture will occur before the great tribulation, then you are actually giving Christians a false hope if your view turns out to be wrong, right? So these are the objections to the pre-tribulational view of the rapture. Let's look at the post-tribulational view of the rapture. Um, this view is also part of the historical pre-millennial view. Now, um, the main tenets of the post-tribulational view says that the church will go up to meet Christ and then escort him back to earth when he returns. Uh, this is what I meant when um, I talked about how um, Christians, in this view, Christians would act as, the Christians being raptured would act as a kind of welcoming committee to welcome Jesus when he returns to earth. So according to this view, the rapture will occur after the tribulation, and it will help usher in the millennium. Post-tribulationists also tend not to use the term rapture, which is not found in scripture. Although, as we saw earlier, rapture does come from that phrase, be caught up with Christ in the cloud. Um, this meeting, in According to post-tribulationists, this meeting includes two phases, although not two separate events. First, 
Christ comes for the church, that is when he raptures the church, and then he comes with the church. That's when all of us together with Christ return to earth to bring um, the great tribulation to an end and to usher in the millennium. Now, this view draws upon the meeting in Matthew 25, 6 and Acts 28, 15 to 16 as an analogy to explain the meeting in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Now, there is an important difference between the tribulation period and the wrath of God, according to this view. According to this view, the wrath of God speaks more of judgment and punishment of sin, and that will occur at the end of the tribulation as a response to the rebellion raised up against God during the tribulation. And so the basis of this argument is that the Greek term thumos, which means outburst of anger, and orge, the state of anger, are used to describe God's attitude towards sinners. Philipsis tribulation is only used twice out of 55 times to describe God's attitude towards sinners. And neither time is it used within the context of Daniel's 70th week. Now, there is Revelation 3.10, which says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I, also, I will also keep Pereo, you out, you from X, the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on earth. So this second um, tenet of post, the post-tribulational view hangs on how you interpret certain Greek words in the New Testament. Now, a third tenet of the post-tribulational view is that there will be two resurrections not three, but two resurrections. There will be the resurrection of the righteous when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, and then there will be the resurrection of all the others at the end of the tribulation. And this is based upon Revelation 20, which does speak of two different resurrections. It clearly, of the first resurrection, it clearly states this is the first resurrection. And then later, it speaks of a second resurrection. Now, um, post-tribulationists tend to be less literal in their interpretation of scripture. A fifth tenet of the post-tribulational view is that the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 7, is either the Holy Spirit or God rather than the church. Because pre-tribulationists argue that the restrainer spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2, who is holding back, who is restraining the man of lawlessness, is the church. And therefore, according to the pre-tribulationists, when the church is taken out of the world, that the restraining power of the church is then taken away and the man of lawlessness is then um, has full reign to act the way he wants. So post-tribulationists argue that this restrainer does not refer to the church, but it rather, rather it either refers to the Holy Spirit or to God. Okay. Yet another um, tenet of the post-tribulational view is that Christ's return is better understood as impending rather than imminent. 
So this is kind of a um, difference in attitude. Whereas the pre-tribulationists expect Christ to come at any moment, literally any moment, the post-tribulationists, um, if I can characterize it, might take more of a wait and see attitude. They say, yes, Christ could come at any moment, but his coming might still be delayed for some while yet. So in that sense, Christ's return is impending and not necessarily imminent. Uh, post, the post-tribulationist view also um, argues that there is no real distinction between Israel and the church. At least there is not a theologically significant difference between them. And finally, the post-tribulational view argues that there is one kingdom of God, which is both present and future. In other words, the kingdom of God has already been inaugurated, and it dwells within our heart. It dwells, um, it, it, is, it can be found in the world as Christians spread the gospel and do the works of God, but there is still a sense in which it is yet to be fully realized, and that full realization will come during the millennial kingdom. Okay, so those are the views of the post-tribulational view. Now, let's look at some, some of the arguments for the post-tribulational view. And these arguments can be found in the uh, argument against the pre-tribulational view that I gave earlier. So if you want to, you can review those arguments, and those are the arguments in favor of the post-tribulational view. So let's look at some critical reflections or some objections to the post-tribulational view. The first objection to the post-tribulational view is the observation that the word church is not seen anywhere in Revelation um, chapter 4 through 21. So in the first three chapters of tribulation, we find the church being talked about. In fact, Revelation 2 and 3 contain seven letters to seven different churches in Asia Minor. And then we have the church spoken of in Revelation 22. But from Revelation 4, from the beginning of Revelation 4 through the end of Revelation 21, the church is not mentioned one single time. And so the pre-tribulationist would use this as an argument against the post-tribulationist to say, see, this is evidence that the church is not present on earth during the great tribulation. So they would argue that this is evidence that Christians will be raptured before the great tribulation. Okay, a second objection to the post-tribulational view is this. When the Bible speaks of the Lord coming with his holy one, that refers, it, that implies that these believers were previously taken to heaven, okay? So there are a few places in the Bible where it talks about the day of, how on the day of the Lord, the Lord will come quote, with his holy ones. And so the objection to post, the post-tribulational view argues that these, the, the use of these words, the holy ones, implies that these believers were previously taken to heaven. Otherwise, how would they be able to come with the Lord on the day of the Lord? And a third objection to the post-tribulational view is that it cannot explain how the millennial kingdom will be populated with sinful people. Now, this argument is based upon Revelation 20, 7 through 10, 
which speaks of a final rebellion or war by Satan at the very end of the millennium. And so how can Satan go out and deceive the nations and make war against God at the end of the millennium if there are no sinners living during the millennium? Okay, and so those who object to the post-tribulationist viewpoint then take that one step further and say, well, it, it's a, um, it doesn't make sense if, if the millennium is a time of perfect peace, perfect justice, a perfect world, then would not the presence of sinners mean that that world is really not perfect, right? And so this is another argument against the post-tribulational view. Okay, so now that, those are the arguments for and against the post-tribulational view. Now, let's look at the mid-tribulational view. So, according to those who hold the mid-tribulational view, the church will experience a portion of the tribulation, but will be removed at some midpoint. They usually identify this with the seventh trumpet that occurs in Revelation 11.15. And at that point, believers will be raptured and they will be kept from suffering the, um, the worst part of the tribulation, which is the second half of the tribulation. And so mid-tribulationists would, would sometimes um, distinguish between the first half of the tribulation, which they would call the tribulation, and the second half of the tribulation, which they would call the great tribulation, because it is during this time that God's wrath is poured out upon an unbelieving world. Now, um, some of the main tenets for the mid-tribulational view um, says that include the include this. Number one, the elect of Matthew 24, 22 and Mark 13, 20 are Christians, not Jews. Okay, so they would argue that when these verses talk about um, the elect, they're not talking about the Jews, they're talking about Christians. This view makes a distinction between tribulation and wrath. Okay, like I said, some of them would identify the first part of the tribulation as simply the tribulation and the second part as the great tribulation. A third tenet of the mid-tribulational view is that the coming of the Antichrist marks the midpoint of the tribulation. Um, this would be, this would correspond to 2 Thessalonians 2.9. And you can also compare this with the um, 11th horn of Daniel chapters 725 and 827. Okay. Now, a fourth tenet of the pre mid tribulational view is that, like pre tribulationism, the parousia, which is a Greek word that means the second coming of Christ. The parousia is separated into two stages. Okay. So the mid-tribulationism also separates the second coming of Christ into two stages. Now, there are some arguments that people use to support the mid-tribulational view. The first of these has to do with their interpretation of 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through four, because according to them, these verses seem to suggest that Christians will be tempted to become unsettled or alarmed that the day of the Lord has already come, which in turn suggests that Christians will go through at least part of the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one argument that they use. A second argument that they use to support the mid-tribulational view is that Daniel 7.25 speaks of how the saints will be handed over to the Antichrist for three and a half years, which seems to suggest that Christians will endure suffering under the Antichrist during the first half of the tribulation, but not the second half. And then um, a third argument for the mid-tribulational view is that the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11.15 is the same as the last trumpet mentioned in other scriptures. In other words, that seventh trumpet is the trumpet that announces the rapture of the church. So there are some objections to the mid-tribulational view. Um, the first objection is that this view assumes that Christians will experience some of God's wrath, contrary to the promise of 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, that God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. And as you can guess by now, this objection comes from the pre-tribulationists, because for the pre-tribulationists, um, First Thessalonians, that promise in First Thessalonians 5 9 is a key part of their argument in favor of a, the rapture occurring before the Great Tribulation. A second objection to the mid tribulational view is that the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11 15 is not the same as the last trumpet mentioned in other scriptures. Okay. So that's the mid-tribulational view. Those are the arguments in favor of it and the arguments against it. Now, let's look at the partial tribulation, tribulational view. This is the last of the four views of the rapture. So the partial tribulational view is also commonly referred to as the partial rapture view. And so um, the description of this view is that part of the church will be raptured before the tribulation, while the other part of the church will remain on earth during the great tribulation. Now, um, there are certain distinctives of this view, and they include that this idea that the rapture is based on merit. That is to say, only the stronger and more committed Christians are raptured as a reward for their faithfulness, while weaker Christians are punished for their unfaithfulness. And a variation on this view reverses things to say that it is we Christians who will, who will be raptured at the beginning of the, rep, of the tribulation, while the strong Christians will remain on earth during the tribulation, since God knows that they will be able to endure the great tribulation. Okay. Now, another distinctive of this view is that some will be taken before the tribulation, while others will have to endure it. Whether, regardless of who you think will be raptured, whether it's the stronger Christian um, or the weaker Christian, other Christians will have to stay behind to endure the great tribulation. And so, according to this view, there will also be a partial resurrection of the believers. Now, there are some def definite um, objections to this view. One of them is that this view goes against the clear teaching of the Bible that salvation is by grace and not by works. Now, it can be argued that not rapturing unfaithful Christians is not the same as withholding salvation from unfaithful Christians. But 
the partial tribulational view is still based upon merit-based thinking, and that kind of thinking is not in harmony with the Bible's teachings about God's grace. This view also has serious problems with ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the study of the church or how we understand the church. Most Christians, regardless of their views about the millennium or the rapture, agree with the Bible's teaching that there is no distinct, that there is a distinction between true believers and those who are not believers within the visible church. For example, see Jesus' parable of the weeds. At best, the partial tribulation view blurs the line between true believers and unbelievers, and at worst, opens the door to dividing believers into those who are super Christian versus those who are ordinary or even unfaithful Christians. So there are some definite objection to the partial tribulational view. So these are the four different views of the tribulation. Um, there are those who believe the tribulation will happen before, uh, that the rapture will happen before the tribulation. There are those who believe the rapture will happen after the tribulation. There are those who believe the rapture will happen during the tribulation. And then there are those who believe that there will be a partial rapture, that certain Christians will be raptured while other Christians will be left behind. And so this ends our lesson on the pre, on the, on the rapture and the views of the tribulation and the rapture of the church. And so I look forward to seeing you in class and discussing these matters um, with all of you in person and online.